Dear great surgeons, let's continue together our upper limb MRCS sessions. So, regarding the muscle supplied by the median nerve, you have to understand the tricks in the exam. He will ask you about the muscles that are tricky. And you have to know which is which. Like the abductor pollicis brevis. Is it supplied by the median nerve or the ulnar nerve or the radial nerve? So, it's not the ulnar nerve because it's a pollicis. So, it's mostly by the median nerve. So, abductor pollicis brevis is by median nerve. The whole senior muscle is supplied by the median nerve, except for the abductor pollicis, which is supplied by, yes, the ulnar nerve. But take care. We have abductor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis longus. The abductor pollicis longus, in contraire, is supplied by the radial nerve. So take care. The abductor pollicis brevis is a senior muscle supplied by the median nerve, while the abductor pollicis longus is supplied by the radial nerve. So let's revise again the median nerve supply in the hand. It supplies the abductor pollicis brevis abductor not adductor the abduction the movement away from the hand not adding to the hand the adding by the ulnar so abductor pollicis brevis flexor pollicis brevis opponent's pollicis and the radial to lumbricals and the skin of the lateral three and a half finger remember the ring finger has sensory supply from the three nerves the radial median and under and this is a very tricky question in the exam by the way and take care that the ulnar nerve supply half of the lumbricals but all the inter OCI are supplied by the ulnar nerve take care a very common question in the exam regarding the air palsy he will classically state it in the form of case yes he will ask you about a case who have, for example, an RTA that causes the patient weakness of right shoulder abduction, take care, and forearm flexion, as well as some sensory loss over the lateral aspects of the arm, and the right biceps and brachioradialis flex reflex are absent. So, what is this? This is herbs palsy, C5 and C6. This produces sensory loss over the lateral aspect of the arm, the deltoid paralysis, with loss of the shoulder abduction and the paralysis of the biceps and brachialis as well as coracobrachialis. In addition to the loss of elbow flexion, the biceps is also powerful supernator of the forearm, so the forearm assumes a pronated position. But take care, a T1 lesion produces claw hand, this is a clombix Policy. This is not herbs. So here we are talking about herbs. While in Clomp's palsy, there is a sympathetic chain injury listened in the Horner syndrome, and this will be stated in the exam with ptosis of the upper eyelid and constriction of the pubis, ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis on the affected side due to T1 lesion, which is not stated here. By the way, in Clomp's palsy due to C8 and T1 nerve injury in the brachial plexus. In the exam, it's not all about the Horner syndrome. He will classically presentation of the clonkis palsy with the claw hand, where the forearm is supinated and the rest of the finger hyperextended with flexion at interphalangeal and metatarsophalangeal joint. Again, there will be a claw hand where the forearm supinated and the wrist and finger are hyperextended with flexion at interphalangeal and metatarsophalangeal joint. In addition to Horner syndrome due to T1, which doses meiosis and hydrosis. Dear great surgeons, take care. From this question, you have to learn to read the last line in any question scenario because the question scenario might be irrelevant to the question itself. So, reading the last line in the question will save you a lot of time, especially when you are reading a question you are not familiar with and reading it from the very first time in your life, like even in the exam. Read the last line, the question might not be related to the scenario at all. This is a very important lesson to learn from this scenario. So, let's be back with the clinical applied upper limb anatomy. 
regarding the clinical finding take care the arterial system of the upper limb is very important and you have to know and be familiar with it a very famous question about the brachial artery take care the brachial artery is very important and it bifurcates into the ulnar radial artery just below the level of the elbow crease and take care the median nerve crosses from lateral to medial at the mid humerus the artery is accompanied by two vena committee and gives off profunda branch near the upper end of the humeral shaft where it accompanies the radial nerve as with all joint there is an excellent circulation around elbow joint there is always anastomosis around the joints so a very famous question recalled in the exam about the median nerve relation to the brachial artery the median nerve again crosses from lateral to medial to the brachial artery again the median nerve crosses from lateral and become anterior to cross it and become medial so you can remember it with the mnemonic LAM lateral anterior then medial the under nerve palsy is very common to be asked in the exam as well as the median and the radial but let take a glimpse about the ulnar nerve the ulnar nerve usually supply the sensation of the skin of the fifth and the underside of the fourth finger front and back there is sympathetic interruption with absence of sweating in the affected area from the ulnar nerve palsy while the thinner muscles are all supplied again by the median nerve except for the adductor pollicis Although the fourth and fifth digit are held in the closed position when the nerve is injured, at the rest, a high lesion paralysis the lung flexors to these fingers, and the result is to lose this sign. So it's more clawing of the hand from the distal injury than proximal injury. If you have injury of ulnar nerve in the elbow, will be no clawing prominent, just like the prominent claw which will appear with the breast injury the rest ulnar nerve injury will show more prominence of the ulnar nerve injury so a very famous sign for testing the abductor pollicis which is the only senior muscle supplied by the ulnar nerve is the inability to grip a sheet of paper between his finger when the hand placed a flat on taper this is regarding the adductor pollicis and as well as the inter OCI are all supplied by the ulnar nerve while the lumbricals which will cause flexion of the metacarbophalangeal but extension of the interphalangeal joint so regarding gripping a paper between the fingers it's due to the ulnar nerve palsy he can't grip the sheet of paper between his fingers because all the inter OCI are affected and by the way bad dab to know which is an inter OCI is affected so bad or dab dab is dorsal abduction while bad the palmar bad abduction palmar abduction dorsal abduction so it's about the palmar Adduction. bad which other are affected a very hard tricky question about an old man who had poliomyelitis in his childhood which left him with total paralysis of the left deltoid muscle and asking you about the clinical examination features will be present he will have a detectable weakness in drawing the arm forward and internal rotation of the shoulder when this is compared to the right side take care to solve this question and understand the answer you have to understand that the poliomyelitis only affecting the anterior horn cell of the spinal cord so there is no sensory loss although the shoulder appears flattened due to deltoid wasting the greater tubercle of the humerus remains the most lateral bony landmark of the shoulder it's a paralysis of trapezius that result in the shoulder drop. Even if the supraspinatus is fully functional, 
is far too weak muscle to be able to abduct the whole weight. The deltoid, in addition to being powerful abductor of the humerus, also assists in flexion and medial rotation, and extension and lateral rotation as well. So, the shoulder, by means of anterior and posterior fibers of the deltoid, will have flexion, medial rotation, and extension lateral rotation with the deltoid, and this will be affected with all my lights. Weakness of those movement compared to the normal side can be detected on careful examination of the patient with poliomyelitis. Again, poliomyelitis only affects the anterior horn cell of the spinal cord. There is no sensory loss. Dear great surgeon, the long thoracic nerve is very important and very common question in the exam to ask it be directly or indirectly and always you will have a patient with a winging of scapula and you will diagnose it sharp it's due to long thoracic nerve injury so to begin the explanation of this question you have to know that seven muscles attached to the scapula the shoulder plate to the chest wall and maintain the normal scapular control these muscles are trapezius levator scapulae rhomboid major and minor as well as the pectoralis minor not the major and omohyoid and cervatus anterior the latissimus dorsi has a small attachment at the base of the scapula but doesn't significantly contribute to the scapular stability. Of these muscles, the radius anterior and trapezius are the most important. A winding of the scapula is nearly always associated with partial or complete paralysis of either of these muscles. Weakness or paralysis of the serratus anterior secondary to a palsy to long thoracic nerve is the commonest cause of winging of the scapula. Again, weakness or paralysis of serratus anterior secondary to palsy of long thoracic nerve is the commonest cause of winging of scapula. While the long thoracic nerve origin is always C5 and C6, those are the motor root, will sometimes contribute from C4 or C7 as well. It's thin, fragile, and runs anatomically coarse from the neck and upper thorax that makes it susceptible to damage by compression or trauma. Commoner cause include surgery during radical mastectomy as well, during the lymph node biopsy from the axilla. You have to be aware of the long thoracic nerve. It's very long, long course and fragile. The stretch injury during sport as in many cases of sport athletes or uh, viral post-infection like the brachial neuritis or other causes of neuropathy like vascular or toxic must be kept in mind as well. So again, the injury of the long thoracic nerve will cause latissimus dorsi palsy which will cause winging of the scapula and this is a very common question recall in the exam. The accessory nerve nerve number 11 it will cause a scapular winging via weakness of the trapezius but this will be milder and would be expected to be associated with weakness of the shoulder elevation which um, in some patient will be manifested and will be clear in the exam so regarding winging of scapula it's latissimus dorsi while the accessory nerve damage will cause milder form of scapular winging due to weakness of trapezius, not the latissimus dorsi, and will be milder and explicit to be associated with weakness of shoulder elevation. By the way, if you are interested, you can know that with nerve conduction study, it will definitely tell you which nerve is affected and which muscle is affected if your uh, examination in real life is not conclusive. But in the exam, he will state clearly the signs. This is great surgeon. A global muscle wasting of the hand indicates damage of both median and ulnar nerve with damage to T1 nerve root. Isolated wasting of abductor pollicis brevis occurs in the association with the median nerve damage from the carpal tunnel syndrome. And more extensive wasting may suggest a broader diagnosis such as syringomyelia or motor neuron disease. Again, 
global muscle wasting of the hand in the case damage to both median and ulnar nerve with the damage to T1 nerve root. Take care. There is no exam will be without anatomical snuff box. You have to be familiar with anatomical snuff box. The posterior border is the tendon of the extensor pulses longus and the anterior border with the tendon of the extensor pulses brevis and abductor pulses longus. And remember, the abductor pulses longus is supplied by the radial nerve, while the abductor pulses brevis is a senior muscle supplied by the median nerve. The proximal border of the anatomical snuff box is the styloid process of the radius and the distal border by the apex of the snuff box triangle, while the floor is the trapezium and scaphoid. The content is the radial artery. So, the scaphoid bone is forming the floor of the anatomical snuff box. The cutaneous branch of the radial nerve is much more superficially and proximally located. Let's revise the anatomical snuff box boundaries again. The extensor pulse is longest medially and the anterior border and laterally will be the attendance of the abductor pulses longus and extensor pulses brevis. Dear great surgeon, take care of the relations of the arteries and nerve for the upper limb. Frequently asked in the exam and there is no exam without the relations of the arteries and the nerves. That's why we are stressing on them. Regarding the relations of ulnar artery, for example, it's about to start at middle of the anticubital fossa as its bifurcation of the brachial artery passes obliquely downward reaching the underside of the forearm at a point about midway between the elbow and the wrist. It followed the under border of the wrist crossing over the flexor retinaculum. It is then divided into superficial and deep volar arch. The relations are deep to the pronator teres, flexor carpidialis, palmaris rongus, and lies on the brachialis and flexor digitorum profundus, superficial to the flexor retinaculum at the wrist. Take care. The median nerve is in relation with the median side of the artery for about 2.5 cm and then crosses the vessel being separated from it by the ulnar head of the pronator teres. This is a very common recall exam question. Again, the pronator teres separates the ulnar artery from the median nerve. We all know that the median nerve runs below the pronator teres and the separation by the ulnar head of the pronator teres separates the ulnar artery from the median nerve. The ulnar nerve lies medially to the lower third, uh, lower two thirds of the artery. Again, the ulnar nerve is, lies medially to the lower third, two-thirds of the artery.